Next, we have Glenn Levine, who is an associate professor of German and faculty director at the University of California at Irvine Center for International Education. And his talk is entitled, Can Multilingualism Be Simulated? Languages and Cultures as Moving Targets Inside and Beyond the Classroom. Hi, that was fascinating. Um, actually, already want to ask questions, but we'll wait. <laughs> really, really outstanding. Um, uh, I, I know you've, uh, Chantal and David, you've been thanked every time somebody comes up here, but I, I really uh, am deeply grateful that, that I could be part of this, uh, this event. Uh, I think every symposium should be run exactly like this and, and bring this kind of uh, diversity of people and ideas together. Uh, it's really outstanding and, and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so I'm going to bring the language classroom into all of this uh, now that, uh, that we've talked about so many different, uh, different issues. Um, so in this presentation I'll tell you a little bit about uh, a, a very new research project that I have begun uh, just in the last year, and it's still in the development stage. Um, and I'll try to get at the question of whether multilingualism can be simulated in the language classroom. Uh, in working it through, I started by asking myself, should multilingualism be simulated? So in, in previous work I've done on classroom code choice, as I call it, uh, I have argued that for the many reasons uh, why language is uh, and should uh, the language classroom is and should be regarded as a multilingual social and pedagogical space, uh, and that the first language and I'll use the term L1. I think that's totally fine to use here. Right? The L1 uh, has important and useful functions as part of language learning and teaching. So my answer to that has been for some, some time, yes, there's a strong imperative to simulate multilingualism if that is possible. And the next questions then for me are whose multilingualism and what sort of multilingualism we're considering. Uh, which led me then to consider that if we're to serve our students well, uh, I think it should be their own multilingualism uh, and not some external, not only some externally determined understanding of it, and that it should be ec ecologically and educationally feasible, uh, and not some new pedagogical holy grail uh, attainable only if they become expatriates or, or graduate students in, in that language. Um, so to the first question of who's multilingualism, um, oh, sorry, who's multilingualism, and uh, what I mean when I say the learner's own multilingualism. So beginning in the 1990s, probably a little earlier, and the rising public debate over globalization and assertions of flat earths and the increasing disregard for actual political boundaries by a lot of people, with the playful and oftentimes contested crossings uh, of cultural and linguistic boundaries, and then to Prensky's influential opening volley in the debate over the nature of the new digital native generation compared with the older digital immigrant generations. Uh, the world of language education, to me, appears to have been left behind in some ways. To be sure, in our brave new digital classroom, as uh, Bob Blake calls it and others call it, the profession continues to merge technologies uh, into language teaching in ways that are often seamless and do take good advantage of learners' digital literacies and diverse preferences and learning styles. There are many teachers affording access to multilingual worlds all over the world, uh, both digital and non-digital, um, every day. But what I'm talking about here and what I would like to argue today is that the way we think about the language classroom as both a multilingual space in its own right as well as a safe training ground uh, for students to go out and engage with the multilingual world may be out of step with the reality of the globalized multilingual world that our students inhabit or at least 
the way many of our students experience uh, their own multilingualism when they go abroad and live in communities, in, uh, communities of practice in the L2 society. So what does this world look like? It's of course largely dominated by global English in many places, uh, but for multilingual individuals in the world, it also means a greater mingling and merging of the digital and the non-digital than we've seen in previous generations. The implications for this language pedagogy, let me make sure I have this, um, are both troubling and exciting. At the same time, they're troubling because it makes the job of the language teacher all the more difficult to help learners gain access to new cultural frames and discourses that have become e increasingly complex, not just with multiple languages in play, but also multiple media for meaning making and hybrid literacies. What was already a tall order educationally is now made more difficult and complex by the moving target of multilingual digital and non-digital discourse worlds to which we wish our students to gain access. But it's also exciting because the very increased seamlessness between digital and non-digital cultures and discourses means that language educators, educators have a multitude of means for bringing the globalized multilingual world to their students way beyond cool internet scavenger hunts and things that we've been doing for a long time. It's exciting because we can think about pedagogy in terms of learners' subjectivities as individuals uh, individual learners, each of whom might connect with their own nascent multilingualism as well as outward to the multilingual world in the safety of the classroom. And it's exciting because we can perhaps bring to bear digital literacies and discourses that our learners may already share with people in the L2 society. The key factor to keep in mind at this point is that what is needed in, a, in pedagogy is a pedagogy not just oriented toward new and clever ways of technologically linking others at a distance. We already can do that pretty well. Uh, but a pedagogy that helps students explore why they would want to do that uh, beyond the goals of language learning and practice. And this is where the teacher can be useful. How might we accommodate and integrate the complexities of a globalized multilingual world into how we approach curriculum and teaching is the second issue I mentioned, that of what sort of multilingualism our students can or should develop. And I propose that we do this through a focus not only on the, the macro level of uh, the global linguistic world, uh, but on the subjective experience of learning and using a new language and connecting with people in a new culture. So in the next segment, I'll do this by actually moving very far away from the uh, classroom in the US context to the study abroad context as the usually ostensible uh, ideal goal of, of what we're teaching our students in the classroom, what we're preparing them for. So acculturation and its discontents. So students abroad and at home uh, in the world. So what I've cut out of this presentation to keep uh, in the time is, a, is a, one, a review of the really, really wonderful, interesting literature on study abroad that's grown in, in recent years, um, work by Celeste Kinginger and Jackson and Pellegrino Veni. I'm happy to share these uh, references if you email me. But I'm going to move straight away to just looking at this small ex examination, uh, a, a examination of a small study I've been working on, on a one study abroad situation. I uh, conducted this exploratory study in order to get a picture of students' experiences abroad, in particular their day-to-day -day uses of language, and in my case German and English, and their day-to-day -day uses of digital media, everything from cell phones to Facebook. And um, I don't want to scare you, sorry, can you read that okay? Um, I've totally violated the don't put too many words on the slide rule because I, I just want to, this isn't about, I'm not here to sort of walk you through my methodology and all that. Um, I might just point out that um, it was a very small group. I had 11 students from different U.S. universities, um, six women and five men. Uh, the interesting thing about them, they were all raised in, uh, reported being raised in monolingual English uh, households. I didn't plan it that way, but it worked out that way. And I'd learned German as a foreign language, either in high school or in college. Uh, and that all but one of them uh, was a German studies minor or major. That, that was also, none of this was planned, because I, I couldn't, I had to uh, take the students that stepped up to do this. Uh, but it's, it's run out of a study center in Heidelberg. 
in, uh, in southern Germany. And the students live in dorms or shared apartments. And they have a, um, a classroom space in the study center and a hanging out space and a German-only rule in their, in their study center. It's, it's quite a nice program uh, that they are part of. They also have an internship, uh, many of whom did it in English, meaning they had to do English things their whole, the whole time they did their internship. Um, and what they did for me is, is an initial very extensive survey about their language background and, and who they are linguistically and about their experiences to that point. And then uh, they then completed uh, a, what I called a, a daily um, language use and digital media log. And it, it was a short thing that I asked them to go online and write and tell me about what they've been doing in the previous 24 hours with uh, digital media and with language. Like, who have they been talking to? Um, you know, who they've been spending time with? Um, and in what language? What languages? Uh, and then I did uh, quite a number of follow-up emails with many of them uh, to ask more about things they had written. And then um, uh, half of them, uh, five of them gave me access to their Facebook pages. I did put there, I got full ethics support for that. That was another story entirely. Um, so that's sort of the, the really short version of what I'm talking about here. So you want to turn the lights back up on that? Um, okay. I'll go right to what I found out. So they engaged um, in what Pellegrino Aveni, in, in a case study of students studying abroad in Russia, identified as sort of four dimensions of the construction of self. And she's drawing from a number of intellectual sources with that, um, namely control, uh, status, safety, and validation uh, um, through daily face-to-face contact with two groups of networks of fellow English speakers. Uh, one was their fellow study abroad students, and the second were their families and friends back home. Most of this communication did take place in English, except in situations mandated by others, uh, usually in the classroom or through in the study center with the German-only rule they had. Uh, and uh, the results can be divided largely into what students did with language, which I'll talk about for a bit. In this case, just German and English. This particular group uh, did not use languages beyond that. Uh, and then I'll talk about digital media. Okay, let me just see how I'm doing. Okay, so first, um, wait a minute, okay. Uh, their uses of English and German would what I would call highly fluid uh, in, in their day-to-day -day practices, and that all of them did use both of those languages almost every day. Uh, and second, that the two languages were important for getting things done, uh, the various things that they needed to do daily. Um, and uh, the overall, as I just mentioned, their uses of German were, were determined externally by coursework and the study center or their internship when German was called for. And that really uh, importantly is that overall the really the meaningful social networks that these 11 people participated in remained in their sort of own culture realm, uh, both digitally and non-digitally. Uh, and so by and large, these students uh, formed social bonds very strongly with each other and contributed to what uh, Papa Tsiba calls a cocoon, a kind of a cultural cocoon in, um, in his French, a study of French Erasmus students uh, studying abroad in different European countries. Um, um, uh, motivations and priorities um, in comparing responses about language choice in their logs and motivations in the initial survey. What was most notable was uh, about the responses was their complete variability. I was not able to pin down any patterns. I, I expected that I would see um, that the students who reported very high motivation to connect with Germans and socialize in Germany um, would also be the ones that report using German the most and English the least. But that is not what happened. They appear just as likely to use lots of English as as German um, in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and so overall, um, most of the students did view it as important to make German friends uh, and spend as much time as possible with Germans while they were abroad. Oh, I'll put those couple of quotes up. Um, even though that by and large, what I have doesn't reveal that uh, they uh, 
engaged in much a whole lot of face-to-face -face interaction with Germans on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So one student, Sam, I'll call him Sam, um, reported the same motivation to connect with Germans, but expressed some frustration. Uh, in, in this item on all of them, except for Sam, they all said, I really, I came here, I really wanted to connect with Germans, and I really think that's important to, to get, uh, um, make friends with German, uh, Germans or German speakers. Uh, but he said, I think it's very important for me because it's the best time to practice my German while I'm in Germany. It's frustrating to hang out with mainly other Americans from our exchange program and speak mainly English because they don't want to speak German and mess it up. I think we're here to make mistakes and be corrected, so we should speak it way more. Interestingly, though, Sam didn't do that in the whole time, um, at least not if his reports to me about his daily use are, are accurate. Uh, the one exception to this consistent sort of response about how important it is was from uh, another student who I'll call Amelia, who reported across the board the lowest degree of motivation or inclination or investment is, is how it's often talked about uh, to, to connect with people in Germany. She says, all, first of all, I really wanted to meet, I wanted to really meet people and make friends with lots of Germans, but then I realized how unfriendly Germans can be to people and I realized that I'm most likely better off sticking with my, with a few friends in the program I do have. I just don't trust people very much for various reasons. So um, I, I don't, I'm not dismissing her as a very deeply felt pain. Uh, in fact, of all the people, I'd have to say the language pain we've been talking about was felt by this, this student, um, perhaps more than with many others. Um, so the overall idealization of um, connecting with Germans is interesting because it suggests an important factor in thinking about pedagogy. So sorry to make that big leap back to what does this tell us about teaching, but that's, that's my job here right now. Except for isolated comments such as Sam's or blanket negative judgments such as Amelia's, overall these students do not appear to make a linkage between the daily use of English and, or German and connecting socially with Germans. Uh, even for Sam, it seems to be about the performance of German, um, of the German language, rather than connecting socially. With the exce without exception, this group's face-to-face -face social networks revolved around fellow program participants, where English, and yes, some German, were part of life nearly every day. And what is clear is that the patterns of code choice do not line up with how we generally teach language in our classrooms, and even how we imagine from the US uh, an immersion experience to be, or how it, it might run. Uh, and also, I might qualify that and say, I'm not claiming that this program is somehow you know, generalizable to any number of programs. There's so many different kinds of programs out there. Um, so, so just to be clear on that, I'm, I'm just looking at this one to try and learn about these categories and these, these ways of being uh, in, in a new place, in a new culture. So in terms of digital communication, see, very few words now, got that. Um, I can be very quick about this. A few interesting and very um, consistent things emerged uh, from all of the data. There were clear patterns there. Texting, this particular group didn't make avid use of texting, as unlike Germans, uh, in part because all of them appeared to have non-smartphones, kind of like my thing here, right, this thing here, and it had prepaid minutes and prepaid texts. So basically that, that was, you know, if they all had iPhones, it might have been a very different thing, but they didn't. Um, so gaming, I did ask them all about gaming. Um, all, only one of them uh, engaged in some little amount of gaming uh, that had to do with really other factors, but watching videos, Almost all of them reported watching videos, movies, YouTube, TV shows with regularity in English. Um, and that very few of them reported ever watching TVs, TV series, or movies in German. I found that surprising, but that unless they're lying, that's what they did. Um, and then social networks and digital interlocutors, with almost no exception, uh, students interacted digitally in English and almost exclusively with fellow program participants who were right there in Heidelberg or with their friends and family back home. Uh, and that the media of choice, with almost no exception, the students communicated primarily by email, largely with family and through Facebook with friends. Um, and then 
every now and then a little with Germans in Germany, in English, usually. So Facebook, that came out to be the media of choice. I probably should have asked you, what do you think the media of choice was? Well, guess what? It's Facebook. Facebook is the, the, the media medium of the moment. Uh, because, and I think it bears on how we model or simulate multilingualism for language pedagogy. I'll focus for a few minutes. Um, check my time. OK. Um, I'm going to focus for just a minute or two on, on the use of Facebook uh, and how they, these people were using it, even though, as I've already said, it was largely in English. So lots and lots of pictures. Uh, it's basically their, their online photo album. Uh, very few text postings beyond single phrases or sentences, by and large, even people who were on Facebook a lot. Um, other thing is, they were having a blast. It didn't matter what they were reporting to me in their log about, about difficulties and frustrations and stresses. That did not appear on Facebook. What appeared on Facebook was fun, lots of fun being had at excursions and parties, just like here. I mean, it won't surprise you to see that if you've seen Facebook but, and, and the personas that people put forward. Text postings, uh, when they did appear, were usually to clarify plans for trips or, or excursions uh, or parties and to comment on other people's photos. Um, and that contact from other people was usually in the form of, how's it going from family in various ways, or lots of expressions of, gosh, I miss you. Right from mom, from sis, from friends, lots of that. Usually unanswered. Usually there, where it would be there, and there wouldn't be a follow-up post. Okay, so use of German on Facebook, um, hardly at all. And really, interestingly, maybe even interestingly for this uh, discussion we want to have, um, only at the beginning, the first week or two, when they showed up in Germany, they were typing in German very much like this. Not much, but those that did put things like that. I'm sorry I did not translate it for people who don't speak German here. I now have a cell phone, but I don't have any minutes. Hopefully, I'll buy some tomorrow. <laughs> so, And I, I live in Europa, Europa House 3, um, so that's what he put up. None of the subsequent postings were in German. That was it for the year. So that's an interesting thing that they start out with this excitement about, uh, about posting in German right when they showed up. OK, let me just say for a minute what students are not using Facebook for, and then I'll, I'll go to my concluding bit. Um, they're not using it to report what they're up to, except for photos showing how, much wonder, how wonderful their excursions and, and parties are. Uh, they're not using it for networking with Germans or even non-study participants, other international students. I always ask them about that, not just Germans, but other international students or other non Germans in Germany. They don't use it for writing in German, for practicing German. I know all the German teachers would be like, oh, I would love for them to use it for practicing German, but they're not doing that. OK, this group anyway. I'm sure there's thousands out there who are doing that, but well, maybe not. Anyway, so multilingual 2.0. Is this multilingualism? They're using German and English every day. Isn't that multilingualism? So based on this brief picture, of the experiences of these university students abroad, we can ask, you know, what sort of multilingualism is this? Uh, we can ask whether it's multilingualism as such, or maybe two monolingualisms side by side while they're abroad. And if it's that latter one, is it is that also monolingualism? I'm, I'm throwing this question out actually for for our discussion. Is it, is it diglossia? Is it something entirely different? So, with regard to adult instructed acquisition. I think we can consider what is important to students themselves, because that's really what I was trying to get at, not just what they're doing, but what seems to be important to them. And that this is not a static thing. I can't just take one brush and, and paint all that. It's, an, it's sort of a dynamic, changing thing even for these people. Um, and that participation in social networks in Germany appeared to happen selectively through instruction or through interactions in their internships or choirs or clubs which all of these people also did, and that uh, participation in Germans' social networks seems to remain on the periphery of their experience for these 11 people, 
even though all but one of them place great importance on connecting with Germans. So my reading of the students' situations matches with what Sam observed. The students want to integrate better into German social networks, um, but the sort of quotidian uh, situated need to, to have control, to maintain status, to have safety, and to achieve validation seem to override efforts that might have been made to move beyond that peripheral experience of German social life. Uh, and so I'd say there's an inherent tension between that idealized or idealistic aim uh, of social connection and the performative orientation uh, toward learning German that the students revealed. And uh, this is where pedagogy comes in the picture. Um, okay, as a language teacher, I can be critical of the students, of these students' language and social networking choices, uh, and wag a finger at them and say, you know, what sorts of teaching in the classroom um, might afford the chance for a less perif peripheral position in German social networks if these were my students? Um, and further, this pedagogical intervention would take place far away from the L2 society, so what are the implications for digital media use if my Heidelberg students abroad remained digitally in their own family and friends networks and in English? Um, so I'll, I'll give you two conflicting positions. Uh, the suggestion of failure to become intercultural speakers uh, uh, through um, language education, that, that language education would envision for these students uh, gives us two positions that appear contradictory. The one position is that these study abroad students remained on the periphery of German culture and uh, society. They remained what Byram described really as tourists rather than sojourners, whereby tourists travel and experience the world but are neither fundamentally transformed by the experience nor do they affect people in the places they visit. According to Phipps and Gonzalez, uh, um, study abroad like tourist travel may be evidence of cosmopolitanism, which allows the traveler to, quote, carry her literal and symbolic baggage wherever she goes and to live out of that one suitcase. So at the same time, at, this, at some level, this constitutes a failure of our educational model, what I was talking about being out of step. For most of these students appear not to have been transformed interculturally in the way we language educators would envision even if they did improve their German and learned a lot about German society and culture, which they did, and found a new sort of independence and confidence that so many study abroad students describe. The other position is that these students were roundly successful. They succeeded at striking a balance between what Pellegrino Aveni calls her ideal selves and the reality of their situations in order to maintain their sense of well-being. The seamless, porous nature of digital and non-digital social networks between being in Heidelberg and being at home served to make this balance all the easier for them to strike. The students were essentially fulfilling what Phipps and Gonzalez and, and others, drawing on Leotard and Ronald Barnett, have called performative language learning and use. We've trained them to regard language learning with this performative orientation rather than viewing it as inherently integrated with their very subjectivities. And this is exactly what they did, and they did it very well. So where do these two contradictory positions meet up? I think they meet at the largest implication for pedagogy. It's not just about the student understanding the other abroad. It's about the student having new ways of understanding herself or himself being abroad. Backing that up to the classroom context, including for the student who never goes abroad, it's about creating affordances for them to understand themselves in the process of transforming their perspectives of their own identities and languages and cultures through learning the new one. And to my mind, this is where the goals of humanistic inquiry and education are brought to bear, even in introductory German or French or Chinese. And so what's needed are means to help learners connect with the subjective or as Claire Kramsch has written, you know, the visceral, the emotional dimensions of language and culture learning from the beginning of instruction. So does the mere fact of their engaging daily in English with their fellow program participants, both face-to-face -face and through Facebook, indicate that all we would need to do would be to remove that component of, from the program, forcing them to find Germans to interact with? 
Uh, some programs do that, in fact. Uh, I suggest this would not be realistic, though, at least for these students I, I got to know, because even in the absence of the US, U.S. student social support network, these students would still need to establish some sort of social comfort zone, face-to-face, -face, online, or both. And what my experiences with these students has taught me is that being in the new culture is on the surface perhaps about learning a new language. They take classes in German, they're engaged in interesting things, German. They relish their excursions and the cultural and historical learning that is part of it. But in a way, it plays out in the day-to-day -day lives of, the, of these people. The way it plays out is much more about students remaining in some sort of comfort zone and that is where we fall short, I think. So in her study abroad, in her study of study abroad students in Russia, and this is, I'm ending here, um, Pellegrino Aveni proposed the idea of identity competence as a pedagogical goal, uh, which she defines as the ability to establish and maintain the desired level of control, status, safety, and validation while interacting in the second language in order to present her his identity successfully. And I consider this to be quite compatible with um, Comsch's notion of symbolic competence, which um, definitely, I think, is still absent from conventional uh, language pedagogy. What we need in the classroom, then, is a way to train learners to operate multilingually in ways that will still provide affordances to learn in depth and critically about the new language and culture, about what's important to people in that culture while still exploring their own self, uh, sense of identity their own multilingual selves. And this can be done through task-based and critical inquiry projects. Um, in fact, I had a long list of things I would love to talk about with how you could make this happen. Uh, it would certainly involve channeling students' digital literacies and practices toward, uh, that, uh, toward connecting in real time with L2 speakers abroad in new ways. I think the imperative is strong to rethink language pedagogy in these terms, to bring what we do into step with the realities of multilingualism in a globalized and very complex world. Thank you.